you get a, a view of his work if you look at some of his, the titles of some of it. And I thought perhaps that would be one way that you would see some of the scope of what he does. So book chapters have included Big Data's other privacy problem, some skepticism about search neutrality, virtual power politics, the merchants of MOOCs, indistinguishable from magic, a wizard's guide to copyright in 3D printing. <laughs> so it, you, you see from this that there's a bit of humor as well as a lot of scholarship involved in the man's work. Professor Grimlin, would you take my place up here? Welcome thank to you. AU. Thank you, Nancy, for the introduction, and thank you to the library for having me here. It's a real pleasure to talk to this audience. One of the great joys of my job is that I get to work with technologists, with journalists, with librarians, all people who have intense curiosity about a wide range of things. And one of the things that keeps me fresh and happy. I'd like to talk about copyright in an age of literate robots. In particular, I'd like to work through some familiar shifts in fair use law over the last few decades, from an unfamiliar perspective, to ask what they say about readers, human and robot. So to talk about readership, we should start by talking about authorship. The modern copyright tradition is built on a theory of romantic authorship, and the term is not to suggest that there's something terribly swoon-inducing about picking up a pen or a paintbrush, but rather the sort of co creativity copyright concerns itself with is the product of a specific human mind. And to quote a famous passage from Justice Holmes, the copy is the personal reaction of an individual upon nature. Personality always contains something unique. It expresses its singularity even in handwriting. And a very modest grade of art has in it something irreducible, which is one man's alone. That's something he may copyright. In contrast, to quote another case, one who has slavishly or mechanically copied from others may not claim to be an author. And we have another name for that slavish copyist. An infringer. Authors create, copyists infringe. But what happens when the copyist is also a creator? It is one thing to say that a pirate printer weeps where he has not sown, but what is the author of a critical review? Whenever copyright can recognize in the copyist the same attributes it admires in authors, it resolves this tension in favor of the copyist by means of fair use. In particular, the courts have settled on asking whether the defendant's use is transformative of the plaintiff's expression. So a famous passage by now Judge Pierre Bovell, the use must be productive, it must employ the quote of matter in a different manner or for a different purpose than the original. If the secondary use adds value to the original, if the quote of matter is used as raw material, transformed in the creation of new information, new aesthetics, new insights and understandings. This is the very type of activity that the fair use doctrine intends to protect for the enrichment of society. The canonical example here is the Supreme Court's opinion in Campbell Music versus Campbell versus A. Cup Rose Music, which held the two live crew of the rap groups, filthy rap version of the Roy Orbison song, Pretty Woman, was the fair use. And this is the traditional shape of copyright. It protects humans writing for other humans. Transformative fair users are simultaneously readers and authors. Human authorship is ultimately about human readership. Digital technologies challenge this story in two respects. Quantitatively, they make it possible to read works on a much greater scale. And qualitatively, they make it possible to read in new ways. I'd like to trace these two trends, and in particular, their intersection. Because when you combine them, you obtain a form of reading that can only be carried out by robots. And remarkably, the idea of transformative use has transformed itself to deal with this kind of reading. The point of departure, which I'll take an inordinate amount of time on, is a 
case called Sega versus Acclimate. Acclimate was a video game publisher. It wanted to sell versions of its games that would run on the Sega Genesis console. And rather than paying licensing fees to Sega, Acclimate took some of Sega's games and reverse engineered them, studying them in detail and analyzing their code to figure out how they worked so that Acclimate could create compatible games that would work on the Genesis. This process necessarily involved repeated copying of large amounts of the game's code, but none of that code was incorporated into the game's Accolade itself made and sold. Accolade's practice poses two problems for a strict transformative fair use analysis. On the one hand, while the games that Accolade made were thoroughly different from any of Sega's games, they didn't comment on, modify, adapt, or build on the expression in Sega's games in any meaningful sense. And on the other hand, the reverse engineering process was painfully literal. It involved extensive literal copying and no new expression of any sort. So Acolyte thus made two uses, neither of which fits the transformative fair use story. The games were too far removed from Sega's games. The reverse engineering copies were too close. And the court's answer was clear and sensible. This was a fair use decision. Accolade's games themselves were not infringing. They had no need of fair use. And the reverse engineering was a form of intermediate copying. It was the only way to gain access to the ideas and functional elements embodied in the copyrighted computer program. So Accolade was like a book critic who starts by photocopying many pages from the book she's reviewing spreading them out on her floor as she annotates them and finds the hypocrisies and the inconsistencies. Intermediate copying for a wholly non-infringing purpose is permissible. So it's easy to see how accolade fits into the conception of a creator rather than a copyist. But the court's reasoning also says something about accolade as a reader. Its employees studied the Sega games closely but not in the way that a consumer playing the games would, to be entertained by them, to enjoy their expression. Acolyte wasn't using Sega's games for their protected expressive content, but simply to extract some unprotected, functional, non-expressive information contained in them. The human audience at the end of the line, Acolyte's customers, never saw any of Sega's expression. So this is a lot to say about video games four generations out of date. But the conceptual twist in Sega versus Accolade is crucial because it stands for the principle that non-expressive reading does not count as infringement. That principle is much broader than software or games. It applies wherever there is something to be learned about a copyrighted work other than its expressive authorship. And that, I'm going to argue, is all of the time. Another line of cases in the familiar world of humans writing for humans shows that even verbatim literal uses can be transformative. In Laval's terminology, these are uses for a different purpose rather than ones in a different manner. In these examples, the work is given to readers in exactly the same form, but for some other reason than the one it was created. It might be necessary to prove that a work exists. That was the case in Nunez versus Caribbean International News Corporation, a case where a newspaper published nearly nude photographs of a model as part of a story discussing the scandal around the photographs themselves. Held fair use. Or it might be necessary to use a work and recontextualize it by putting it in a different setting that brings new meanings to it. That was the case in Bill Graham Archives versus Dorman Kindersley. The defendant publisher took Grateful Dead concert posters and showed small versions of them on a timeline in a 480-page book. The posters weren't there to be shared for their po the posters advertising concerts. They were there to illustrate history. These cases easily fit the transformative use model. But combine them with Sega versus Accolade's idea of intermediate copying, and you get a powerful new principle. 
verbatim copying of a complete work will be protected as fair use if the copy is used solely as the input to a process that does not itself use the work expressively. <coughs> or to put it a little more provocatively, non-expressive uses do not count as reading. They are not part of the market that copyright cares about because the author's protected market consists only of readers. A string of recent cases, for example, deals with the reproduction of journal articles for submission to the patent office as prior art. The law firms preparing these applications have generally succeeded in arguing that their reproductions are fair use. And the courts easily find that complying with the legal obligation to submit relevant prior art is a different purpose. But in excluding the law firms and the patent office from the audience the publishers intended to reach, the courts use language that starts to exclude them from being audiences at all. One court explained, quote, the law firm's use of the articles is narrower than and indifferent to their manner of expression. Another court said that when an applicant submits prior art to the patent office, it, quote, it is transformed from an item of expression, of expressive content, to evidence of the facts within it. The expressive content becomes merely incidental. These cases speak in terms of transformation of the work, but the work itself changes only in the eye of the beholder, a different context or a different mode of reading. To say that a work is no longer an item of expressive content is to say that it is no longer being read expressively. Now it's time to pick up the other strand of our story, the shift from retail uses to wholesale. Take the search engine cases, of which Perfect 10 versus Amazon is the leading example. Google's search engine crawls the internet and helps people find web pages on it. Its image search engine does this by showing small postage stamp sized thumbnail images of the images you're going to find you click through. This, the court held, was a transformative fair use even though the thumbnails are exact replicas of the images they begin to. The court said, although an image may have been created originally to serve an entertainment, aesthetic, or informative function, a search engine transforms the image into a pointer directing a user to a source of information. Note how the search users are understood as readers. Google does give them access to the plaintiff's expressive works, but in the act of using Google search itself, they are near automata. They follow a pointer supplied by an electronic reference tool. Any aesthetic appreciation is suspended until they arrive at their destination and admire the full-sized image in its original context. The court is able to elide the human audience by downplaying its humanity. A similar move is visible in Van der Heij versus I, I Paradigms. There, high school students were required to submit their papers to Turnitin, a plagiarism detecting service. Turnitin would check the papers against a database of previously submitted essays, then retain the papers in the database to check future papers against. And this, the court held, transformative fair use. Turnitin's use was completely unrelated to expressive content. One of the Google Books cases, Authors Guild versus Google, takes this concept even further. Google's database of millions of scanned books doesn't just support a comprehensive search engine of the sort of Perfect 10 versus Amazon approved of. It also enables new uses in the digital humanities. For example, tracking changes in word usage over time. These uses do not count as infringements, to quote the court. Google Books does not supersede or supplant books because it is not a tool to be used to read books. The now rejected Google Books settlement inadvertently captured this same idea when it defined permissible non-consumptive research as research in which computational analysis performed on one or more books, but not research in which a researcher reads the book or displays substantial portions of it 
to understand the intellectual content presented within the book. And another strand of the Google Books litigation against its partner libraries gets at the same idea indirectly. The author plaintiffs have argued that the library's database of digitized books created a security risk. Hackers would break in, steal millions of books, and destroy their value. The court disagreed, called these risks speculative and hypothetical. Note the framing. It's <coughs> undisputed there were at least four complete copies, four different physical instantiations, each of millions of books. But they don't count. There's no evidence in the record that any humans were ever likely to read them. The copy falls in the forest, and humans aren't there to hear it. The sound is not infringing. All expressive, non-expressive uses are fair uses. But when we talk about non-expressive uses, we should perhaps refer to them by another name. These are non-human uses. These are uses in which we as people do not make use of our human capacities when we participate in these uses at all. So perhaps you've seen the tension. We've developed a two-track copyright system one for human readers and one for robots. Uses involving human readers receive close and exacting scrutiny to make sure that no market belonging to the author is being preempted. Uses involving robot readers are fast-tracked for fair use. Another pair of recent cases illustrate the tension. Both involve news, water, news monitoring services. A company called Meltwater scrapes news articles from 160,000 websites. A company called TV Eyes does the same for TV news on 1,400 stations. Both cases turned on fair use, Meltwater lost, and TV Eyes won. The difference between the cases doesn't consist in their facts, which are uncomfortably close, but rather how the two courts conceptualized the services. Meltwater saw the service as something for human readers. It helps them organize and optimize their consumption of news. TVI sees it as a digital, digital service whose operations are at heart impossible for humans to carry out. Watching a thousand channels forever is a task so far beyond human capacity that it's simply different in kind. Take that, John Henry. There's something downright bizarre about this state of affairs. It creates strong pressure on entrepreneurs to keep humans from ever touching copyrighted works. I've developed a life on transformative fair use, but it seems to me that the tension here is sharpest. Still, there are other areas of copyright where you see the same trend at work. Take the process of DMCA compliance, of responding to takedown notices for infringing material posted online. There's a test that suspends the safe harbor if the host knew of or was aware of red flag knowledge suggesting infringing activity was afoot. If you don't have people in the loop, you can't develop that knowledge. The safest thing to do is have an automated system that just responds immediately with no human oversight. The same is true of the volitional conduct test for infringement, which says that in many cases, no infringement will take place without some volitional act relating to the infringement. The logic for network operators, the 512A safe harbor, is even stronger. It says that you are absolutely immune from copyright and liability under certain circumstances, one of which is that the copying is made by an automatic technical process that operates only as an automatic response. No humans need apply. So robotic readers are here and they walk among us. If you count by the total number of words read, it's overwhelmingly the dominant form of reading now. Search engines crawl the internet ceaselessly, reading hundreds of millions of web pages again and again and again. Quietly, almost invisibly, copyright law accommodated them. And the rule is that robotic readers get a free pass under copyright law. Copyright applies to humans only. This is hardly the only field of law to work with an idea that what happens in silicon stays in silicon. Google defended itself against privacy lawsuits, claiming it snoops on Gmail messages, 
by saying, no, we never look at your messages to target ads to you. That's all done by computers only. The NSA gave a similar argument in arguing that it doesn't collect or acquire email communications that are copied into databases. Only when an analyst actually reads your email has it been collected. The rise of high-speed trading algorithms raises uncomfortable questions about whether a computer can ever have the requisite mental state to knowingly engage in market manipulation. So this is a broader question, but to my knowledge, no other field has so thoroughly embraced the idea that robots don't count as copyright markets. So before I proceed, three points that are all important. The state of affairs is entirely consistent with the copyright theory of authorship. It is amply supported by existing copyright doctrine, and it yields, I think, completely sensible results in all of the cases that have come before the courts. But there is still something unsettling about the idea that robots can infringe with impunity. Take spam bots. They recycle everything from Shakespeare to sports journalism into a semantic word soup that is used to create new texts whose entire purpose is to get past your spam filter and sneak that ad in front of you. And their goal is to look passively close to human writing without being too obviously cut and pasted from some actual existing text. If we take the reasoning of the robotic reader cases seriously, spam bots make transformative fair uses. Indeed, they're outstanding remix artists, some of the best cut and paste and recomb recombination artists ever to work. And their only intended audience is other robots, spam filters. If the spam filter is a robot reader, and the spam body is one too. So perhaps we really do want to give spam bots free reign, or perhaps copyright is the wrong tool for stopping them. But it's certainly an odd consequence of let a robot leadership run amok. The logic of non-expressive use encourages the circulation of copyrighted works in an underground robotic economy. It tells businesses that touch copyrighted works to hire more robots and fewer humans, and by being so permissive about robotic reading, copyright paradoxically denigrates human reading and writing. Surveying the media scape of 2014, it's hard to escape the sense that the dominant forms of expression are robot readable media. The world is awash in robots writing to be read by other robots. Millions of Wikipedia ones, you've all found these on your surfing online. Not spy emails. This is all robots writing text to be consumed by other robots. But take a moment to acknowledge the role that humanity's creative expression plays in fueling this robotic arms race. Our collective creative output is the source material they train on. We're teaching robots to read like us and write like us, not primarily for our own entertainment or edification, but as a side effect of a struggle of algorithm against algorithm for aggregated slivers of human attention. So in its extreme form, this leads to questions of whether humans are necessary at all. What if in the process of accelerating this robotic creation, we make our own creative <laughs> output irrelevant? What if the progress unleashed by robot readers is not one in which we humans will share? And this is a kind of corollary of the reading. Whenever we say that what these reader, robot readers do is not a kind of human reading, not a kind of reading that they care about. The attempt to set these uses apart from human experience also sets humans apart from these uses. So, here we're living in a little digression. One of the classic texts of the Industrial Revolution is Melville's The Tartarus of Maids. The narrator tours a mill and marvels at its metallic necessity, the unbudging fatality which governed it. Along with the rows and rows of blank looking girls the mill's machinery makes into their own executioners, themselves wetting the very swords that slay them. Melville's mill was a paper mill, producing only blank paper, no printing of any sort, the raw material for writing. In the information revolution, where copyright treats all human expression as raw material for the data mills, perhaps we are not the maids, but the paper. This at least strikes me as part of the fear 
motivating things like the authors build lawsuits against Google. They're concerned, I think, much less with snippets and small bits of expression than they are with the ingestion of the database at all. The sense that their works are being pulled into something at heart fundamentally non-human. I think you get a flavor of this in some authors' arguments against Amazon. It's selling books, but somehow in a mecha mechanized, robotic way, it causes discomfort. I am reluctant to wade too far in these waters. It's, you lose sight of man quickly. Making reliable predictions about a technological singularity is by definition impossible. The singularity is the moment in which all prediction becomes impossible because change comes so quickly. If robots take over and replace humans, they'll replace our copyright laws too. <laughs> if we are transformed beyond recognition, so will our copyright laws. At the very end of the day, I tend to doubt that copyright law will play any substantial role in bringing these changes about or preventing them. The imperatives towards mass digitization are so strong that they're unlikely to be held back by copyright law, just as file sharing has not been significantly set held back by copyright law. Rather, more immediately, the danger here is of creating a parallel system of communication that's completely disconnected from the kind of progress we humans care about. In reasoning about bulk non-expressive uses, it's important to connect them back to the individual uses humans do engage in. Robots are not people. They cannot, for now at least, enjoy the expressive content of a work. They are not its intended audience. And we should be talking instead about how humans read with robots. Does we read with glasses or with friends? And this is the real value of non-expressive uses. It's not a value shared by all such uses. Digital humanities, text mining to learn about patterns in the history of literature, that tells us something, something we as humans can walk away and appreciate. Spam bots either conspicuously fail the test of bringing value to living, reading humans, however clever their word salad algorithm may be. We should be looking for cases in which Robot readers produce downstream insights for human ones. A search engine gets people started down a path that will lead them to fundamentally human insights. Turnitin makes professors better readers. Google's Ngram viewer to look at the usage of words over time helps human researchers understand the sweep of literature. And at its best, the vision of human-robot collaboration is a form of humanism for a digital future. In 2010, the chess champion Gary Kasparov wrote a remarkable passage, a remarkable essay about human computer chess. He was writing about the results of a freestyle chess tournament, an online tournament in which people could enter with any combination of humans and or computers. So you could have people using computers to make moves. You could do whatever you want. The surprise came at the end of the event. The winner was revealed not to be a grandmaster with a state-of-the-art PC, but a pair of amateur American chess players using three computers at the same time. Their skill at manipulating and coaching their computers to look very deeply into positions effectively counteracted the superior chess understanding of their grandmaster opponents and the greater computational power of other participants. Weak human plus machine plus better process was superior to a strong computer alone. And more remarkably, superior to a strong human plus machine plus inferior process. So to summarize that, humans who could work effectively with robots played chess better than the best humans and better than the best robots. And our ability to use tools well matters more than the tools themselves. That's what the future of robot reading looks like we may have little to fear. The robotic reading refocuses our attention on the really fundamental questions. What is copyright and what is it for? To say that human readers count and robots don't is to say something deep about the nature of reading as a human activity and a social practice. If what matters most is not a particular flicker of neuronal activity, but the ability to take part in the exchanges that bind people together through shared experience, then robotic reading is not now recognizably human activity, 
but it could perhaps one day become one. Indeed, we should be trying to make it into one, rather than holding robot reading as something set inherently apart from anything we human readers do. to take this conversation anywhere that you would be interested in going. <laughs> yeah. um, what interests me, uh, it seems to me that transformative use seem to be taking the work and transforming it in a creative or artistic way. And somewhere along the line, a court said, no, transformative could also be the purpose, so that you could make copies of something if it was for some other purpose. Where did we get off that tangent? What happened was the transformative use was the perfect characterization of a trend in cases in fair use going back 100 years. And Judge Laval nailed it with his article. So the phrase transformative, which gets taken up by the courts, becomes the perfect description for what's going on in these cases. That also makes it the perfect word to wave around when you want to find for the defendant in a fair use case. So courts that wanted to explain that this use they were seeing before them was one that ought to be allowed for some reason, seize onto the label transformative and apply it in cases where it doesn't fit. So what winds up happening is you have a second line of cases that don't fit the version you're talking about, where the authorship remains unchanged, but the context or purpose changes. And unfortunately, we are stuck with the use of the phrase transformative to describe what's going on then. You know. That strain contains the recontextualization cases, so the ones in which you put a work on the wall and then put criticism underneath it. And it also contains the non-expressive cases involving robotic reading. You see some courts and scholars attempting to say, these are still defensible but it strains language to call them transformative. We need a new term for it. We don't have it yet. Yeah, I, I, in light of Bridgeport, for example, I mean, it, to me, that is transformative in many cases, where a <clears> sample <throat> is taken that is so different than the original, at least after it's been processed, and yet the courts have held pretty much strict liability when you're using uh, a sample of sound recording. So the sound, this is, this is a sound recording case. Bridgeport involves a small sample of a drum hit that is sampled, changed, and then used as the backing for a different track. And the court there famously said, get a license or do not sample. Interestingly, Bridgeport and most of the cases in that line are only about the initial case of infringement. They say that even that sample is enough to infringe. There are two reasons this may not general. One is that those cases are based upon reading the Federal Copyright Act as it applies to sound recordings. And the courts, in fact, justified their refusal to adopt an exception for de minimis use on the fact that the text there is slightly different than it is for other copyrighted, other copyrighted works. And the other is these cases, by and large, don't talk about fair use. So you have these two tendencies coexisting. Incredibly broad initial case of infringement which then requires fair use to come in and do a huge amount of work. Um, I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about uh, images. You touched on it a little bit with the Google image search, but as uh, things are being developed that let there be automated reading of images, how does that fit into uh, Image recognition and recognition of things in video is one of the next big fronts in uh, know, robotic reading. So TVI, as I mentioned, basically watches the news and, t and translates the audio there into intelligible <coughs> text. And you're getting all of these techniques in Facebook and Apple's iPhoto, all these others automatically tag images based on who they think is in them. And so there's a sense in which this is only looking to see the underlying uncopyrighted factual content. Who is that person? At the same time, that facility with generalizing from a large number of images, you can see how that dovetails with a lot of work 
that involves creative tools or computer automated composition. You do that and you now have some, you now have algorithms that can stitch together beautiful time-lapse videos from just random shooting you do. You just walk around carrying a camera and you're going to have a pretty ugly time-lapse video because of the shakes. The algorithms now can smooth it out to prevent this elegant, smooth swoop to the space that corrects for your jitters. On one level, level that's uncreative, it is just the algorithm equivalent of a steady cam. But on another, it is taking something that was unlawfully and making it more appealing to people. String pieces together like that, and you're starting to see algorithmic creativity. Okay, this, this is great. Um, so I'm a, I'm a law professor up the street at AU, and I have a question about sort of your view of this and how it applies to, to broader areas of the law. So this distinction between uh, human and robotic in patent law, for instance, what I do, um, has had strains in patentable subject matter doctrine where there have been some judges who have said, well, if humans could have done this, it's not patentable subject matter. It's not the sort of thing we want to give a patent to. But if it's a purely uh, robotic output that humans could not have done, that's a different thing. Right? So that's a different outcome than I think you're talking about. Copyright, we're just saying, patent wants to protect a robotic <laughs> thought or a robotic reading and not the human version. Um, so I wonder if you thought about how your ideas might play in other areas outside of just copyright doctrine. That's a great question. I think part of that story comes to Baker versus Selden and the line <coughs> the courts draw between copyright and patent. So there is an idea that the roboticized the technical arts belong to patent and not to copyright. But this cashes out very strangely when you come back to patentable subject matter because of the idea that in theory, if a human could have done it, then it's something that's, that's a process that is not abstract and therefore not patentable. And this is really problematic because a human could in theory do anything computational. So when you just get post, wrote a post that shows how with pen and paper you can mine bitcoins. You just do have the math by hand. You will go incredibly slowly. You will probably not succeed in getting any bit times in your lifetime, but you can carry out all the steps of the process. It's only a matter of degree. And so without venturing too far into how patents should resolve that tension, I think one of the things that I'm starting to come to after thinking this is I'm very uncomfortable with this sharp divide that we really should be thinking about how humans use technical processes and copyright. And I'm going to guess it's funny that I heard this a similar answer in patent. It's going to be very hard to get a clear answer thinking just about the process. You get at least more pragmatically defensible results by thinking about how people would take advantage of this activity. I don't know how that plays out in doctrine, but that's how I frame it. This is very uh, a, 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 a helpful structure to uh, understand what we're going through right now with the copyright and the information. And, and now I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. And where do you see, do you see any legislation trying to work out this in this area? Or do you think we're going to bump along with maybe case law and try to figure it out by trial and error? If there's legislation, it will not be driven by a desire to actually think through these questions and resolve them. The legislation is being driven by the political desire to have the form of the Copyright Act, which has accumulated a lot of corrupt that annoys a lot of people for various reasons. There may be a coalition to redraw the Copyright Act. I do not see this process, except by accident, resolving most of these issues. I get the sense that there's pretty good consensus that the parts of the Copyright Act that are working well are the general ones, like the basic line between idea and expression. And I don't expect that language to change. And as long as it isn't, the courts will continue bumping along in the same way as we've been seeing. Well, one difference between human readers and robotic readers is that we want to, these copyright owners want to charge human readers. Like, 
robots are you know, inanimate objects, but do you see any reason why commercial firms should worry about uh, robotic, does it do any harm, economic harm? So, let me take this on the two steps. Obviously, the robots don't themselves have bank accounts that they can use to pay for things. But they do, can, they can control things. Um, and we are seeing algorithms that have the ability to execute financial trades. So many Wall Street firms are quite happy to let their computers go and spend money. In that setting, the difference between the human spending money and the robot spending money, it's a tangent. I can start seeing those same firms letting the computers make what seem like semi-autonomous decisions about when to purchase information that might be valuable in executing trades. And we play that out. Copyright owners are always arguing, this is a market we should be entitled to license. We should get paid for this use because it's valuable. And that share of value is only going to grow as people figure out more and more things to do that just involve having the robot touch the media and learn from it. So I think this tension is going to get stronger and stronger. And if you talk purely economically about the copyright system and why we have it, there's no reason to draw this distinction. There are great conceptual reasons that's what we think authorship is. But if you're speaking economically, there's not a great functional difference between human, human and robot media. Jensen, I'm going to ask you to sort of step away from being the lawyer and be the, and be the scholar. How does this disrupt, augment, change the scholarly process? You're seeing this heavily in data intensive fields. That the task of scientists has increasingly come to look like the work of people doing econometrics. How do you find an interesting data set and tease out good questions from it? And what's going to happen is the toolkit people use to tease out interesting patterns is increasingly automated. You talk about people just running with multivariate regression. It's just like, if you have the Excel tables, the computer will just do it for you. Computers are going to get better and better at filling in missing data and cleaning it up as part of the processing stage. So that's where people who work with data sets and have to earn their keep right now is figuring out how to bring things together and make two sets of data talk to each other. That process will be increasingly automated. And we're going to see the extension of those methods to other parts of the endeavor. Other fields that have had traditionally quali quantitative parts will be increasingly driven by, can I gather data sets into this? So you see this happening in many of the sciences, especially in bioinformatics. Very qualitative science that would involve perhaps some observational data now involves extensive computation around identifying mutation pathways or around gene sequencing. And really just, we're seeing inroads in the humanities in which people are having really interesting and important arguments over what kinds of insights we're actually looking for. I don't think a lot of many of the things people claim to find in texts. So to say that some authors in the 19th century had distinctive styles that were different from their contemporaries. He is not to tell us something we've not already known. But we're going to find unexpected things that will get translated back into, into insights that someone else anticipated the idea, the themes in a canonical work. And we'll find those in ways we wouldn't have known to look for them before. History, literature, we're going to see a lot of thought about how to find and summarize patterns across things. And fundamentally, I think the work of the researchers is a lot harder because we have so many more things we're expected to read that we have to rely on computerized prostheses to take them down. This is true in my own field in which the universe of cases that a typical scholar could be expected to follow it's just much larger now. That everybody has to be something more of a polymath. And you are, because there's that competitive pressure there to use all of these abstract services and 
annotating tool is. It's just the it's expectations that we have isn't there. And I think that's going to be the case in the circulation of scholarly literature in all fields. So the, the, the pure human with no computerized tools to keep up has going to have a hard time competing given what the academy values. So it, start, it makes us start thinking about what are we teaching the undergraduate students that, that they're going to need the rest of their professional lives. In a sense, they're teaching themselves it. I mean, they go on Wikipedia or try to figure out answers by thinking in databases. Uh -huh. Since you mentioned uh, data sets, there are an increasing number of commercial services that draw upon uh, public domain data sets from government agencies and NGOs and whatnot, and then they compile them in some ways, maybe repackage them, but maybe not, and then make them available as a compilation. And are you aware of any cases where such companies that do that have <clears throat> brought lawsuits against users because they retrieved the data from that service, although it came from a public domain source, but then they downloaded it and redistributed the data from that commercial service? This fellow has two tracks. The European countries have database protection legislation, so these are explicitly protected uh, as data. And while with a pure public source that doesn't kick in, when you have a service that combines data from multiple sources and claims some kind of improvement in the overall database, I can see that kicking in. In the United States, you get a using contract. So you have a fair number of companies that contract with governments to either collect the data for them <coughs> or to make it accessible. <coughs> and in those cases, they require that users click to agree to terms of service. And when they sue on those terms, they're <coughs> successful more often than not. Many of the most recent cases are involved in map data, so tax maps or other assessments that the government just collects. Oh, guess what? You have to go to a private firm, and they'll charge you for access, and they'll sue competitors who be published the data. In terms of the um, databases, I mean, the brand, the databases that we have, oh, we have so many, and they keep multiplying every so often, and we have more and more and more. How, and then uh, we have a paper student or we're doing ourselves searching for an article. And we get that article from who knows what journal that is in this database that is selling the subscription to us because that's what we are doing. We paid a subscription to that database and they are getting, I don't know how does it, does it work in terms of the copyright. I imagine that we are not liable, the library, for accessing those databases, subscribing to them, because there's a licensing and we have to pay for the subscription of that uh, service? So it's going to vary. So in some cases, the library will subscribe to the database. Correct. And that license, as part of the subscription, mm -hmm. will allow the library's patrons, mm -hmm. or authenticated to the library, mm -hmm. to download through the service. Mm -hmm. And in other cases where articles are available open access, mm -hmm. if you can find a copy of the article that is outside of the licensed database service, then you download it directly mm -hmm. and provide it to patron that way. The typical, more typical solution is just the license covers the library and its patrons for uses as defined in the license. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you mentioned uh, open access, uh, we have a lot of databases that are called an open access, that they are they come from government agencies, from all kinds of that, but they are not subscription based. We we don't have any problem liability with that. There's always the risk that something will be included in those that actually is copyrighted. Because we don't deal with with, with licenses. There are no licenses there. No but subscription. As a practical matter, if something overall that's published open access, mm -hmm. the <clears throat> risk that individual items within it will actually infringe is tends to be small. 
talking about robots and humans. Uh, what do you think about chimpanzee selfies? <laughs> oh, I, I, do, I do this question with my students. And there's a... The, the, the doctrinal answer is clear. Chimps aren't humans. They don't count. Uh, that selfie is born uncopyrighted. I had a dialogue with my students mm -hmm. in class last week on this issue. And some of them tried to defend the idea that the person who owned the camera owns the pictures. Others tried to say that, well, the chimpanzee can't own the photo, but whoever owns the zoo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and this comes from this epic that everything must have a copyright owner. That shows you just how firm, how far we've come since the 1976 Act. Before that, it was totally possible to have things that copyright just did not apply to. And now the baseline of something is that everything is copyright. It's actually not true. Many things, the way a tree grows, totally uncopyrighted, nobody owns it. And that space for some things just aren't owned. That's the public domain. That's normal. If there are no more questions, that's for a Please thank him for coming here today. lines of humor, and you have to listen so carefully to get them. Um, and it's one of the things I've always loved about his work, and you find it in his written work as well. Would you write up here your blog so that people can follow you? Um, because it, it, mm -hmm. it, the, the scholarship and the humor are, are so deeply wedded in here that you have to be careful as you read his work, but I do recommend it to you. I mean, he describes himself as studying how laws regulating software affect freedom, wealth, and power. And how as a lawyer and a technologist, he helps these two groups understand each other through his writing about copyright, search engines, privacy, and other topics in computer and internet law. Um, we're delighted you were here with us this morning, and thank you very much. Um, I want to let you all know about three things. One is we have these little sheets available to you that are going to be passed out to you, where we'd particularly like to know how you heard about the event, because we've got a great audience here mixed from this campus and the law school campus, and that's terrific, and we want to make sure that, that we reach you in all the ways that, um, that are best for you. And we also invite you to give us other topics that would be of interest to you, because this is a continuing series that the library puts on. And to that end, the next one that we will do is the remaining one this fall is called Beyond Bibliometrics, and it looks at libraries, the academy, and the future of scholarly impact. And in this, we're particularly looking at what are the other ways of measuring impact? What are the ways of looking at which scholarly discourse has, has made its way through the academy? And that one will be November 13th, same time, same place, and we invite you to come back. And then we've got two more coming in the springtime. One of them, particularly for those of you who are faculty and who write a lot, is developing your own personal identifiers for your research so that it will follow you and you will be able to claim and bring together the body of your work. And we'll have people here to talk to you about doing that. And our last one in March is going to be on improving openness and re reproducibility in scientific research. So it's a nice panoply of ways that we've addressed the topics of scholarly communications. And delighted to see all of you here this morning. And for those of you who can, please stay and have lunch with us. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming.